Hello everyone and welcome to Pisa Presents, Episode 3, How to Recognize Different Types of Trees from Quite a Long Time Away. Number 1, the Archaeopteris, not to be confused with Archaeopteryx, which is ancient wing. This ancient fern, as the name translates to, was named in 1871 and it was first classified as a fern on the basis of its leaves, which you gotta admit, do look pretty fern-like. Problem being, in 1960, well, <laughs> yeah, so they had been studying a woody plant named Calyxylon, which had been named about 50 years prior. Now, they discovered that Calyxylon was in fact Archaeopteris. Now, this is something that's happened a lot in science. Specimens get mistaken for one species or the other when sometimes they turn out to be the same. And with these new features bundled into Archaeopteris, they were just, hey, this is a tree, a progymnosperm tree to be exact. Now, errors like this actually come along in science. They're not necessary errors, mind you, but really at the time, scientists simply didn't have the basic understanding of a lot of key concepts in botany and ecology that we do today to realize that these were one and the same species. So not simply understanding what they were looking at, it's actually pretty easy to make the mistake. So, progymnosperm trees. They are extinct woody plants with spores, like those spores right there on a modern fern. Spores are used in reproduction. Now, it's thought that these trees evolved from very early vascular plants, very early, and then in turn perhaps led to flowering and seeding plants. They first appeared around the Devonian and lasted until the Permian. And at the time, there was nothing like them in the world, so they filled a huge niche in many environments and quickly became the dominant components to global forests, being found even in Antarctica. So certain species also as well developed particular traits, leading them to become in good environmental indicators. In other words, if you would find a fossil of, say, specimen one that you knew only grew in a certain climate and had certain soil conditions, then you knew that that particular locality at the time had those conditions. So here's a specimen classified Excalis gyland, which again is Archaeopteris. Now it's just, you'll see in a lot of places, people will use it as a term for fossils of the inner part the actual, like, the woody part of the tree itself. So, is it the first tree? Mm, no, actually. <laughs> there are several trees that predate it, but it is considered by many to be the first large tree. Here is Archaeopteris macellenta, which is a species in the general northeast, and overall, Archaeopteris appears from about 385 million years ago to, say, 323, 320 million years ago. Now, overall, they could be over 100 foot tall. There have been some clocked at over 130. They show the beginnings of growth rings. Their trunks were roughly three foot wide, or could be. And because of all this, it allows us to determine many specimens at about 50 years old. So here's a different specimen right there, different species rather as well. So a couple other firsts, it's the first plant to have a large developed root system, which becomes absolutely staggeringly important for our planet's history. It's the first to have lateral buds, which are the function on limbs that allow them to develop branches. They also produce special spores, which basically hinted at earlier could have become the ancestors of seeds, which is something that is very much argued in not only botany, ecology, but also paleontology. So why was Archaeopteris so important? It was a huge part of ancient forests found all over the world. Their root system developed these soils. So being developers of the paleosols at the time around the world, they had a massive role in determining the other plants and the climate of these habitats that they were in, especially too because they may have had special filtering abilities for carbon dioxide which the role that they had in not only determining but shaping their own client climate was really, really insane. So here are some fossil sites in the general area. The most famous one is definitely Red Hill, I'd say. They're also found in large row cuts of the Catskill Formation, and also very famous too are Cairo and Gilboa in New York, 
with down there. There's a little link that you can type up for uh, some of these sites in New York. And so what happened to Archaeopteryx? Well, it was a victim of its own success. Not only it, but a whole ton of other species as well. The theory behind Archaeopteryx extinction is because you gotta admit it is kind of weird that such a specimen is so dominant for so long and then it goes extinct. Well, they shape the climate so much that the idea is is that they caused a mass extinction. And because these trees had gotten to be so huge and so many of them were so specifically adapted to their own environment, they couldn't survive a mass extinction that they caused. But at least that's the idea. It's still very much up to science. So I hope that that is a little bit into just really giving you an idea of the amazing world that Archaeopteryx created. Thank you very much, folks, and join us some other time then. Bye!